Oh! <laughs> it's meant to go out of the dinghy, not into it. <sighs> we left the dinghy here, but due to rain, it's filled up. So we've got to move the dinghy uh, because we don't want it here. Once, on a, once before, we had a big strong gust and it blew it up onto the pontoon. We don't want that again. So we're going to just move the dinghy over to the boat. But while I have the dinghy here, <laughs> I'm standing in water, uh, we want to talk about how we lift the dinghy out. So if you just give me two minutes, and by the magic of YouTube, <laughs> you don't have to sit through it. I'm going to get rid of this water so I don't get cold feet because it's freezing. <laughs> no, not again! I know I can lift the boat and drain it through the back, but with the weight of water in here, it's actually quite heavy. There's quite a lot of water in here, so I'd rather pump it out. I've just broke the dinghy pot. Well, there it goes. Okay, so what we do is when we want to get the dinghy up onto the boat, we use the main halyard to lift it. And what we have done is we have these lines that we have tied to the dinghy's hard points, I suppose you could call them. And we've adjusted the length of these so that when we lift the dinghy, it stays level. It takes a bit of fiddling. You just got to put knots in and adjust it until you get the dinghy level. But the, the trick that we've used, the lines cross over like this. So the forward one goes in behind the aft one. And we have a loop that we put the main halyard into. And like I say, we've got the length of these lines as such that when we lift this, it stays level, it's balanced. And that was just a case of just simply adjusting the length of the lines and putting knots in until, until it was right. We just hoisted it up on deck and, and did it. And that is enough to get the dinghy out of the water. And it works really, really well. The only tricky bit is getting that loop onto the halyard when the dinghy's down there and you're up on deck because if somebody's in the dinghy, you can't lift them as well. So what we do is we just set that down carefully and we can grab it with the boat hook. We make sure it's open when we set it down like that. And we simply reach down with the boat hook and grab it and pull it up. And once we have it on the boat hook, we can put the halyard through it. Well, welcome to this, the first of our series on night sailing. <laughs> At least <laughs> when we were looking into it and researching it, it felt like it was going to be a series, but I think we can squeeze it into an episode, so we'll do our best. <laughs> it came up because one of our subscribers uh, just asked us an incredibly simple question, which was how many night hours we've done. <laughs> and we don't actually know, to be precise. Uh, the last time we toted it up, which was quite a while ago, I have to confess, we had about 130 to 159 hours, from, I can't remember which figure it was, and we've done quite a few since then. Uh, but our normal response is far too many. many. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, that also feeds into some other conversations we've had with um, sailors who have never sailed at night. And they've said, is, you know, how difficult is it? What do you have to do? Um, so we thought we would do this episode on night sailing and what you need to do for it to make it as easy as possible. The one, the first thing is why should you uh, do night sailing? Um, I mean say in a lot of places in Scotland you can get everywhere and do time your passages so that you just do daytime sailing. Yeah, I mean, by and large, if I don't have to sail at night, I won't do it. It's not, it's not my first preference. It certainly isn't mine. I would uh, prefer not to night sail. Oh, well, I look, feel and yeah. look like uh, rubbish, but there you go. Only because it's 
very early. It's just gone us past midnight here on Salty Lass. Um, but the um, high tide in Liverpool is at two o'clock in the afternoon. But if that's the way it's going to work, uh, for instance, duration. Some passages are just going to take too long. Mm. Um, a good example is going from Liverpool to the Isle of Man. Yeah, it's a 14 hour passage any way you cut it. So unless you do it really in around June 21st, you're not going to get 14 hours of daylight. It's not going to happen. Um, so what you need to do is um, you try and time it so that when you leave, which is the complex bit, and when you arrive, which is another complex <laughs> bit, they're the bits that are, are in daylight. Yeah. Um, with the um, bulk of the passage where not much is happening mm. is at night. Yes, basically. So... You know, that may be the reason, uh, another reason you might have to night sail. Um, a few weeks ago, we had planned a short passage which would have us arriving round about sunset. Um, conditions changed while we were out. The wind came around in front of us, slowed us right down, and we arrived about three hours after sunset, and it was pitch black. So, circumstance in that case forced us to night sail. We didn't get any choice in the matter. Um, also, uh, because we uh, do a lot of passages in round um, UK waters, uh, the tides just might be um, mm. better for doing nighttime sailing than they are for, say, day sailing. Mm. Um, at the moment, the south going tides have been progressing more and more into the evening, so that you're coming either you get mega, mega early and arrive in the day so you've got the night sailing at the beginning or you leave in the day and you arrive at night um, that's just way that the the tides are working so if you've determined that for some reason you're going to have to night sail or if there's a possibility it might happen to you because conditions are maybe unpredictable um, the next question is, how? How do you organise yourself for it? How do you make it as straightforward as possible? Because your lookout is going to be massively impaired because you can't see anything. So, in preparation, some of that preparation is gaining knowledge. Hmm. Um, for instance, knowing what lights look like at night. Mm. Um, how your voyage looks, knowing what light patterns um, are on your buoys and things like that is gaining some knowledge. Yeah, particularly, particularly if you're going somewhere you're maybe not too familiar with. Um, for instance, if you were coming into Carrick, uh, obviously the marina entrance is marked by two laterals, uh, a red and a green. So is the harbour. And the harbour is like 200 metres away from the marina. And it's also marked with a red and a green. And they both flash. So you need to know which set of reds and greens are the harbour. Which set of reds and greens are the marina. Otherwise you could wind up in the wrong place. Um, so, you know, reading up in advance. And making a few notes about what you're going to expect to see when you get to the other the other end. Is, is an important factor. Um... Also, when you come into marinas, um, there can be um, marker lights, mm. uh, leading lines, things of that nature, um, or a sectored light. So knowing what you're going to be expecting yes. is a useful first step in preparing yourself for mm -hmm. sailing at night. Uh, the next thing you should consider is the crew. Uh, sailing at night is harder on the crew. There's no two ways about it. It just is. Uh, and it's harder on the crew because nobody can see what's going on around them and it's colder. It is a lot colder sailing at night than it is sailing in the daytime because you've no sunshine. Hmm. Um, so you will need good warm clothing. There's no two ways around that. Another thing is um, our spray hood is up. Yeah. Because that gives at least some protection from the wind. You get some protection from the spray hood and it does make a difference. It does. We did one sail. One sail with it down. <laughs> we were freezing even in the millions. <laughs> I need to warm. I missed the spray hood. 
So yeah, if you have a spray hood, put it up. Uh, don't worry about the loss of visibility. It's pitch black, you can't see anything anyway. Think Make sure you've got things like decent food and it's got to, it needs to be hot food and yeah. hot drinks if you're expecting to do like six or eight hours in the dark then make sure you've got at least two meals you know three four hours apart uh we use soups a lot mm -hmm. at night um just sort of like even if it's just like half a, a cup of soup that will just warm us up um half a cup of soup bread roll and a bread roll yeah. so having lots of hot drinks and things of that nature is very, very important. Another thing you need to know uh, in preparation is learning your instruments. All boats and boat systems are different. <laughs> I'm laughing because she's right. Uh, all boats and boat systems are different, but even boat systems, I mean, on this binnacle, we have three instruments from Raymarine and every single one of them has a completely different way of activating it for night sailing <laughs> so I mean even three instruments from the same manufacturer have got different ways of operating them at night it's it's crazy but it's one of those things you're better off experimenting with in a marina at twilight than out at sea but also um, with our light system um, they have uh, phases um, so that during at the beginning we have it brighter and then as the night time progresses mm. we dim them down further and further um one of those reasons is to improve our night vision mm -hmm. um and otherwise and um because if you look at the screen it can be a bit far too bright and you actually if you get well dark adapted looking at the screens if you haven't dimmed it down can be can be painfully bright it's 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 actually hard to read them because they're so bright you have to squint at them and that's just not on so we, we we darken them down as the night gets darker and darker and by the time it gets to full darkness the instruments are virtually turned down to nearly nothing and you can still see them perfectly clearly so um once you know how to uh, turn them down, when you do finish your passage, always bring them up to brightness. Yeah, before you turn them off at the end of the passage, for goodness sake, turn, turn the brightness back up again. Otherwise, you'd be like me with your head under a blanket or a coat trying to figure out why the screens are black the next morning. <laughs> I've done that more than once. Oh, dear. The other lights um, that you need to know how to turn on in your own boat is um what nav lights to use mm. um for instance um if we're motoring then we have um we have the fore and aft lights on that mm. uh whereas um if we're sailing we have a tri light at the top of the top of the mast top yeah. of the mast so knowing uh which lights you need uh, for the different circumstances and check the bulbs make sure they actually do work so make sure you do have the right light uh, for being at night well oh. Beverly joked at the start of this video that she thought it was going to be a mini series well we waffled that much we waffled that much it practically is going to be a mini series <laughs> Uh, turns out we took over an hour of footage and we've got to get it down to a 15 to 20 minute episode. Well, that ain't going to happen. So the upshot of this manoeuvre is that we're going to wind up having to do two episodes. So you've obviously just watched the preparation for a passage and what to do for the boat and the crew and what you should expect. And in next week's video, we will do the actual mechanics of the passage, the actual sailing at night, what you should look out for, how you should organise the boat and what to do when you're coming in and what you should be looking out for so there's lots to watch in next week's episode <laughs> and uh... <laughs> so until then uh, do keep your comments uh, do put your comments down below uh, ask questions and uh, we'll be seeing you next week for another nighttime sailing and if you've missed uh, if you i was going to say if you've missed part one but you can't do this is part one <laughs> And you can't watch part two yet. No, you can't. <laughs>